Father God, may you turn our attention to your word today for the next few moments. May you bring us encouragement, God. May you bring us hope, God. Whatever the people are standing in need of this morning, these are your people, God. They're not my people. They're not this church's people. But God, they are your people. So bring life, bring hope, <clears throat> bring healing, bring encouragement. And God, we believe in you. We trust in you in this hour. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You probably have some talk notes in your hand, and you can just put those to the side because we're not going to be using those this morning. I was up here till about 11 o'clock last night just praying and seeking the Lord and saying, God, what do I say? How can we respond? How can we talk to the people today? How can we bring hope? How can we bring faith? How can we bring encouragement? And so I believe God gave us just some simple words, and I'm not going to preach super long, and I know you've heard that before. <clears throat> but this morning, how do we respond to life? How do we respond when life happens? How do we respond when people are hurting? How do we respond in the middle of this flood crisis? Um, <clears throat> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up with just kind of an illustration, and I don't want you to turn me off and crucify me, but one of my favorite bands is the band U2. And so, anybody know who U2 is? So, by the Joshua Tree. And uh, anyway, they, great band. Um, and so, their lead singer um, is a believer. Claims to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and a few years ago, um, U2's lead singer, Bono, was talking to the um, National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C. And I, I read this quote <clears throat> last night, and it really spoke to me. And I just want to read it for you, and I want to add to it, um, because I, I believe it's kind, of, uh, um, it's kind of where we're living right now in this hour. It says, he says this, he said this at the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, God is in the slums. God is in the cardboard boxes where the poor people play house. By the way, ironically, where no church people like to go. God is in the silence in the mother who has infected her child with a virus that will end both of their lives. God is in the cries heard under the rubble of war. God is in the debris of wasted opportunity and the debris of wasted lives, and God is with us if we are with him and if we are with them. And can I add this morning, God is with those that are in the floods. God is with those that just last night have had their homes ripped apart by tornadoes all across our state. God is with those who are in the middle of loss. For many of us in this place this morning, God is in the middle of the unknown. <clears throat> Did you hear this preacher say that this morning? God is in the middle of the unknown. We don't know what's going to happen. We can predict. We can do cute maps we can do the best we can but we don't know this morning God is in this is for somebody this morning God is in you fill in the blank and it might not be a flood situation you might feel secure you might feel safe but whatever you're going through this morning as best as I can God is in it because he promises us that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. And see, in the church and in our lives, we run away, away from him. But he never, ever runs away from us. <clears throat> Aren't you glad about that this morning? We in this community are experiencing crazy, I mean, all across the state and the, the Great Plains area, we are experiencing crazy rains crazy floods, barges <laughs> running away and running loose and slamming into dams. It's, it's just a crazy world and life. Um, I did some research, and, and correct me on this if I'm, if I'm wrong, but do it at the end of service. But this community hasn't seen any flooding of this type since 1986. 
And, and the flooding that we're experiencing now, to my understanding, has even eclipsed what was experienced in 1986. And they tracked it. Um, this community hasn't experienced anything like this since the 1940s. So what do we do? What do we handle? How do we handle what's going on in and around us? How do we help those around us? And so this morning, <clears throat> just for a few minutes, um, or however long it takes, we're going to just talk as a family. And we're going to be God's family today. And we're going to talk at the end together. But I just want to share some things. How many of you are familiar with the, the, the flood story in the book of Genesis? Now, I'm not going to get into the theological ramifications of, you know, why did God do the flood? Does God um, still do floods today? And all that stuff. This is not a theological, really deep conversation today. Okay, But what I do want to tell you is that when I read the book of Genesis and when I read that story, um, it, that story teaches me something, and it teaches me that God never withdraws his participation in our lives. That God, as, as, as um, uh, uh, I can't believe, I, I, I forgot what his name was, as uh, Henry Blackaby, that's who, in his book, Experiencing God, he, he makes this statement. He says, God is always at work around us. And sometimes we might not like the work that's going on around us. And we might not like the situations, and we might not like um, the, th the things that we're involved in or the things that others are involved in. But the bottom line is that whether we understand or not, which many times I do not, I'm not going to be so theological and so spiritual this morning and religious that I say that I understand everything that God does. Because I'd be a liar. And I don't think you can be, 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 if you're honest with yourself, I don't think you can admit that you understand everything that God does. Because if you do, then maybe you need to be up here. I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm not being rude, I'm just, I'm just being honest this morning. There are things that I don't know, many things. There's many more things that I do not know than what I do know, okay? But what I do know is that God never withdraws his participation in our lives. Instead, he decides to walk in with us through the thick and through the thin and to be involved in the darkness in our lives and all around our lives. So think about the flood story in the book of Genesis that, that we know God did flood the, the world and, and he, he gave a way of escape. By the way, God always makes a way of escape. I'm so glad about that. There, there's always an ark. It might not be a physical ark, <laughs> but God has always provided a way of escape. Are you with me? But in the middle of the darkness, I'm here to tell you, because when you read the end of the story, there's a rainbow. And I believe that God calms the floodwaters and the, the floodwaters of our unsettled lives, and he helps us build arcs of safety for our lives and in our lives, and he renews the covenant that he promised thousands of years ago and that there will always be a rainbow. And we might not be able to see it right now. Barbara, you might not be able to see it right now. But there is a rainbow that God is strategically crafting just for you and your family. I believe that. And this is the thing. we got to keep looking up. Because it's so easy to walk around in our culture and in our life and to look down. And when we look down, we forget to see Jesus. And we forget to say, God, I'm not saying that there's going to be times that you won't walk around and look down because there is. That's the reality of life. But friends, we've got to keep looking up. Number one, because Jesus is coming. But number two, we've got to keep looking up because Jesus is always at work around us. And if we're not looking up, we're going to miss that which God is doing. And that which what God is trying to teach us. So I, I just want to tell you the framework this morning is that God's promise from at the end of that story in Genesis of the rainbow, that was God's promise to always be with us. And then he fulfilled that promise thousands of years later when, when he sent his son Jesus. Because Jesus said in the book of Matthew, the first chapter, Jesus said, uh, the, the description about him is he says, I am Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is with you today. God is with the people of Muskogee today. God is with the people of Fort Gibson today.
the people of Braggs, the people just, man, Coeta and Wagner, just God is with. I want you to understand that today. And I hope that that's comforting for you, that God is with us. Now, here's the thing. Just as God is with us, here's the, here, here's the shift. He calls us, calls us to be with others. So in this time, I want to encourage you and I want to ask you as a church to devote your life to be with others. Because this could be, I just want to tell you that this could be one of the greatest revivals in human history. Because when people need hope, when people are hurting, you can usually talk, start a conversation with them about Jesus. <laughs> and they're going to listen. Because whether they believe in God or not, they're going to ask you for prayers. We were in the restaurant the other night at American Pie eating chocolate calzones. And we were with a group of people, and, and, and I was just sitting there in some shorts and a T-shirt and just, just eating and, and enjoying the food. And, and our, our server, young gal, comes up to me, and she's like, are you a pastor? I was like, it depends on who's asking. <laughs> I was joking. And she says, I just had a feeling that you were. And I was like, are you okay? I said, do you need prayer? And she, she bowed up and um, not in a bad way, but it looked like she's about to start crying. I said, we're going to pray. Let me have your hand right now. I said, this is my wife and these are our friends. And, and we, in the middle of American Pie, lifted her up in the name of Jesus. You never know. But I was eating a chocolate calzone and bruschetta and Dr. Pepper. I don't have time for that. But when God presents opportunities, you have time for that. You make time for that. Dinner can wait. Being called into the service of the king is what matters. Amen? So how do we be with... I, I just want to give you some things. There's, there's a couple things that the Lord laid on my heart that I think we as a church, how, can, how we can be with people. We have to help people understand, and you can write these down if you want to. You don't have to. God is close, number one, to the brokenhearted. Psalms 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and He saved those who are crushed in spirit. I love what Rick Warren, Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church in California says about this passage. He says, for the heart that's guilty, God says, I'll give you a heart that's forgiven. For the heart that's resentful, God says, I'll give you a heart that's full of peace. This is the word for the hour this morning. For the heart that's anxious, I will give you a heart that's confident. For the heart of fear, God says, I will give you the heart of faith. For the heart that is angry, because can I just tell you, it's okay to be angry at God and all this. Don't get on your spiritual high horse and hobby horse and say, you know, well, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Can, can I just, can I, all right, I'm, I'm just going to be bold right now. Can I tell you what people don't need? Is a bunch of scriptures quoted at them about the judgment of God. And people don't need a bunch of judgment. If you would just be courageous and have faith, people don't need that right now. Can I just tell you that? What people need is somebody to walk into their situation and be, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, be the hands and feet of Jesus and actually not just say what Jesus says, but do what Jesus did. I saw some churches just posting scriptures all over the place, and I'm like, well, how's that going to help somebody? I'm just, I'm just being honest. I'm being honest. we got to live scripture, not just post it on Facebook all over the place. Are you with me? And he says... I'll give you a heart that's forgiving and instead of angry. And what God wants to do with people that are broken and people that are hurting right now is God is in the business of giving heart transplants. And that's a long surgery. It's not just you go in and you're in and out in an hour. Any type of heart surgery is crazy. It's a process. So God is closer to the brokenhearted and then the second thing I believe God was speaking to me and, and saying, share this with the people, is, is not only do we understand God is close to the brokenhearted, but we are called to walk the journey with people. Romans 12, 15 says, be happy with those that are happy and, and weep with those that are weep, that are weeping. 
to rejoice with others is means when they have a win and when they're experiencing wellness and when they're experiencing life and prosperity, that we, that we take an interest in that and we rejoice with them. Even if their prosperity and their health and all the stuff that's going on in their life supersedes what you're experiencing, you're still called to rejoice with people. Right? Because we're not all going to rejoice. We're not, we're not all going to be blessed at the same time. And we're not going to all be broke at the same time. Broken. And I'm not talking, when I say broke, I'm not talking about financially. I'm just talking about in our life. But then he also says, weep with those that weep. In other words, labor after a compassionate and sympathizing mind. Let your heart feel the same distress. Put yourself in their shoes. Put themselves in their position so that you can understand and bear their burdens. We're called to be burden bearers, friends. Because maybe one day, see, I like to say it this way. Is the church... Is not a country club for the believers. The church is a hospital for the hurting. And as the church, we are called to carry the stretcher for those that may need it. Because at some point in our lives, as sure as I'm standing here, you're going to be the one that's going to need to be put on the stretcher, and you're going to need somebody to carry you. Are you with me? That's very important. So we walk the journey with people. Then, one of my favorite texts... Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, we're called to give hope to people. But those that who, who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. See, notice the prerequisite for the Lord renew, renewing their strength. There has to be hope in the Lord. You can't have renewed strength if you have no hope. If you're hopeless, it's hard to be, you know. If you got a hole in your tire, I don't care. You can go down to Quick Trip or you can go down to come and go. You can go to your, to your garage and you can put your air compressor up to that, that tire and you can blow it up day after day after day. But if it has a hole, which represents no hope of ever being fully filled, are you with me? I'm, I'm making it simple. It's still going to run flat. And there's people right now that they have a hole in their lives and they're hurting and that's why I said we just can't quote scripture to people because for a lot of people, they've lost hope. They've lost their faith. And you can say, well, if they would have been walking close to Jesus, this wouldn't have happened. Garbage. Okay? You say, if you would just had a, I, I, I detest when people say, if, if people would just have enough faith or if they would have just had more faith. Didn't the same ones that walk with Jesus? Where was their faith when Jesus was arrested? <laughs> what, what, what about, what about uh, the story of Lazarus? If Lazarus would have just had enough faith, he wouldn't have had to die and be wrapped in a mummy and then be raised back to life. If he would have just had more faith, he wouldn't have had to go in that dark tomb. Am I right? It's not a matter of you turn on them television preachers and the minute they start saying if, if, if they would just have enough, turn them off. Because that's not scriptural. That's not scriptural. Yeah, but what about Jesus? He said, oh, you have little faith. If you just have enough faith. No, that's not, that's not what I'm talking about today. When we're trying to shame people and guilt people that are going through trials and tribulations and struggle. Because Jesus said in, Matthew, er, in John 16, 33, in this world, in this life, you will have trials and tribulations, you will have floods, you will have tornadoes, you will have all kinds of chaos happen in your life. If the Son of God had chaos and turmoil in his life, why wouldn't we? Are you with me? But here's the thing, we're called to give hope. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. We need to be hope givers. We are called to be Jesus people in this time right now, to be givers of hope. And maybe, there's, maybe, maybe you're here and you need to receive hope, and that's, that's okay, because we're going to give you hope. <laughs> because again, we're not all hurting at the same time. We have hope in Jesus inside of us. There's no better time to pass that hope. My last two... <clears throat> is that we pray for those that are in need, and we're going to do that today at the end of the service, so be prepared for that. Psalm 66, 17 says, I cried out to him with my mouth. 
I want to read something to you. In the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 14. He says this. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Number one, let us hold fast to the confession of our faith. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but he was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Verse 16. Now, because we know that, let us therefore... The writer of Hebrews, I believe it was the Apostle Paul. Many theologians debate that. But he says, now, let us... And he doesn't, he stops. He, he doesn't tell us what to do yet. But then he says, let us, then he, then he reconfigures us, and he says, now let us therefore. In other words, he's drawing our attention not just once with the let us, twice with the therefore. What's he say? Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. And it goes on to say, why? So that we may obtain mercy and find grace. Watch this next phrase. In time of need. The inference is there is there going to be a time of need for all of us. Even the psalmist David cried out to God. And he cried out to God with a sense of urgency in Psalm 66, 19. And we know that God heard his cry. God listens. God listens to the cries of the people. So we need to pray. We need to pray for those that are hurting. We need to pray for those that are grieving over the loss in their lives and their livelihood, their incomes, those that are fearing and worrying right now, those that are questioning what's going to happen and, and what is happening. Help those, pray for those in the recovering efforts and, and pray for those that need help so that we can help the hurting. Here's my last one today. So I told you this wasn't going to be long. Is that we got to do something. James chapter 2 says, faith without works is dead. So, so I wanted to give you a really good picture of what that means. In the Greek, when he says faith without works is dead, he says faith without works is like a lifeless corpse. Can I go further with that? It's like a lifeless corpse that begins to stink. Would you think about this one for a second? There's a lot of lifeless Christian in church that stink. Let us not be one. Let us not be lifeless. That's, that's why, and, and I'll do a teaching on it at some point, and, and, and we're not trying to prime your pump with worship. That's why lot, worship, when we enter in the... See, that's why the, the psalmist writer says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. He didn't say, enter it like you're walking into a funeral procession. And there's a lot of people that, that enter into the house of the Lord guided under the misguided notion of we got to be reverent. See, I grew up like that, that you had to be reverent. And if you didn't, the church mother would be, ha, shh, purr. Man, what you ladies carry in purses? You didn't have cell phones back then. My God. But we have this misguided view of God and, and reverence and what reverence is and is, is not. Reverence is not quiet, quietness. Reverence is a holy awe of God. That's what that means. It's a holy fear of God. And he says, enter his gates with thanksgiving into his course with place, that, that he wants us to be life-filled and not lifeless. We've got to live as though we got life. Because Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So that's James 2. We've got to do something. But then another one of my favorite scriptures in, in Luke, one of the stories is Luke chapter 10. The story of the, the, great, the, the good Samaritan. The really good Samaritan. And see, right now we have the attend. We have the the the, um, 
the option that, that we can be like the priest or we can and walk on by and then we can be like the Levite who, who, who walked on the other side of the road. And see, we, we do give the priest and the Levite a bad rap. Which, I mean, they low down dirty dogs. But, but see, what you've got to understand, the priest was on his way to make sacrifices for people. He was really trying to help people. And the Levite, he really couldn't touch, he, could, he, he, he thought the, the guy was dead. So it would have been sinful for him to touch the dead person, right? But then Jesus comes along, and what Jesus was really saying, it's okay to touch dead people. Dead in their spirit, those that are lifeless, those that are hurting. So today I implore you, let's do something. And we've already started doing things as a church, which is really awesome, and I'm really proud of that. And I'm proud of you as a church. And uh, man, you guys are great. And so, so what do we do with this? So ushers, if you could come right now, quickly. Don't be lifeless, ushers. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> just joking. We got some good ushers that put up with me. We go from five, five sections to four to three. They, they don't know what we got going on when they come in. But this is, this is what we can do, friends, and this is how we can respond as a church body. And y'all can do what you want to in, in the terms of responses, and, and that's cool, but, but I just want to lay out some things. I was, I've been, been in touch with, <clears throat> with City of Muskogee officials, with uh, the City of Muskogee Emergency Management, been, been trying to get a hold of the Red Cross, and so we're just going to look at this real quick. I know you guys can read, but we're going to talk today as a family. <clears throat> we're partnering with the Muskogee Emergency uh, Operations Center, which that includes the Red Cross, that includes the City of Muskogee, that includes the City of Muskogee Emergency Management, that includes the EMS, that includes um, ODOT, that, and that includes um, the Corps of Engineers. So um, rather than, than getting kind of spread out, with, with trying to connect with all these different people and entities and organizations. It's all under one header. And starting um, tomorrow, um, we're going to come in and set up, and, and the office is technically closed tomorrow, but, um, but it can be open if, if needed. But we're going to set up in the welcome area a table or a few tables, and we're going to have them um, kind of sectioned off, if you will. And what we're, gonna, we're, we're asking you guys to do is to do this to bring these things that are listed on this paper, you know, water towels, blankets. I mean, you guys can read that. Um, <clears throat> and if you're not able to go buy stuff, you know, feel free to give us a, a monetary donation. We're not going to do, like, online giving for that or anything like that. Not that that's bad, but, but um, we're, we're just going to kind of try to keep it in-house and kind of keep it organized. And, and, and we have great financial people here in this church that, that do a good job of categorizing everything in our books and stuff so when money comes in it goes to the right area and then it goes out and it's dispersed and so, so we make sure to do that. Um, and then um, I'm going to work on through our, our online church management system we're going to create an event and it's, and it's going to be this last one um, roster of volunteers and so here whenever the, the water does recede we're going to ask you to if you want to to sign up and and, and, and and what we're going to do is we're going to send that to these people, and they're going to create a big spreadsheet. And so then as people need help, you know, scraping mud off porches or pulling drywall or whatever, they're going to say, hey, we need 10 people to go here. We need 12 people to go here. Um, also, um, part of that list of volunteers will help me as the pastor because Sister Barbara, you know, her, lost her home. And so whenever, you know, she knows directions on what that's going to look like, you know, we're going we're gonna to jump in and we're going to help her first because we're going to be the church and we're going to help her and we're going to help any other people inside of this church that, that have lost and experienced it. And so I believe God, when he sets up parameters in Scripture, he says, go to Jerusalem and Judea and the uttermost parts of the earth. So right now as a church, she's our Jerusalem. And so, and so we're going to minister to her, we're going to love her, and we're going to, to do what God calls us to do. And then we're going to reach out to those other surrounding areas and those people that we know of needs help. So, so pretty much that's what we're going to do. Um, if you have any questions... Um, feel free to text, feel free to call. Um, and so I, I'll just tell you, I've never, I've never led anything through this like this before. Um, 
I've gone through a couple tornadoes, you know, when I lived in Ohio and then when I was in school and more, but um, never in the church, you know, really experienced anything like this. And so um, we're going to, first of all, we're going to be patient and we're not going to, we're not going to jump on, on, I mean, because there's all this stuff floating around on Facebook. Please don't distribute, contribute to the chaos on Facebook and share things that, that like, <laughs> you know, you know, you don't know is true or not because that, you know. Um, confuses people, and so, but what they're going to do as these needs come in, um, as, you, as you guys bring the stuff, I'm going to get, I'm getting text messages, so there's a bunch of stuff gets thrown out on Facebook, and through all these different entities and stuff, it's like, oh, this, this needs this, and this needs that, and so we don't know who's it going for, we don't know where it's going, we don't know if it's going to shelter, it's going to somebody, you know, next door, so what we're going to do is I get these texts, and they're, they, it legitimizes what need, needs are, and then who they're for, and stuff like that, and then we can go ahead and take them to the appropriate entity, whether it's a shelter, whether it's personal to somebody that we know or, or don't know. Um, and so, so that's what, that's what we're going to be doing. So um, here in a moment, we're going to pray and then we're going to dismiss. But at this moment, does anybody have any questions? Does anyone have? Um, I, I think it's just, it's everything. You know, because there's people that, that are displaced and at these shelters, they're going to need to take showers and things like that. So, so it's going to be kind of a combination of, of those things. Um, Non-perishable food items I know is a big deal right now, especially in the Fort Gibson area um, because so many people, they got power restored, but they lost their refrigerators and things like that. And so there's, there's, there's a shelter here at Bacon, and then there's a shelter over at First Baptist in Fort Gibson, and they're staging food at the, um, the old elementary school gym. And so, um, you know, we can get supplies to there too. And so, um, and also if somebody would be interested, because I just want to tell you, um, I don't like grocery shopping. And so if, if anybody, you know, we're also as a church, you know, again, we're, we're still figuring this out as we go, we're just gonna go grocery shopping and, and just take the church credit card and we're gonna buy a bunch of stuff. And so if anybody would like to do that, um, let us know. We can give you the card, give you a, a limit, and, and we're going to do that. We're also going to connect. Like I said, we're talking to Sister Barbara and find out what, what her needs are. She's staying with her brother right now. Um, she told me she had peace, and, and I'm thankful for that. Um, but we're also going to help when some of the reality <laughs> sets in. And so, um, did you guys have any damage last night up in Sapalpa? You guys are good. You haven't, okay, okay, okay. Are, do you know if, if everything's okay? It's okay, okay. I thought of you guys last night when I saw that. It's good to have you guys and, and see you guys back here. We've missed you. Any other questions? All right, this is what we're going to do. We're just going to close out the service, and um, Jason's going to start some soft music back there. And I'm just going to call you guys just to come and let's humble ourselves and let's pray for whatever God lays on your heart. Pray for Barbara. Pray for those others that are affected, those that are stranded in the surrounding areas. And, and pray how we can be the church that God has called us to be. So would you, would you come?